Well, good morning, good evening, good good night. Uh, wherever you're at, I thank you for checking in on this uh, fourth lab group, uh, laboratory automation and informatics virtual event. Um, so I know this is a special time, and I really appreciate uh, lab groups because they had force, foresight to know about uh, the future in terms of virtual versions of conferences. And this very trying times, it's really uh, shows its power. So, um, so thank you again. Uh, thank you for staying up late if you're in in a time zone that's uh, that's the other side of the world. So my name is Abe Lee from UC Irvine. Uh, as just introduced, I'm from biomedical engineering. Also run a research center and uh, it's called Center for Advanced Design and Manufacturing of Integrated Microfluidics. Um, today, my title of my talk will be uh, trying to uh, bridge the multi-scale physiological systems via microfluidics. Uh, and, and I'll talk a little about how it scales from the single cell upwards for organ cells, also how single cells um, itself can scale down to the molecular scale. And next slide. So this is a brief overview of the outline. Um, I looked at the attendees list and I found that you have a very diverse, I have a very diverse group of people listening in. Some of you are um, students, some of you are faculty, some of you are researchers at universities or at uh, companies, and some of you are in sales, some of you are writers. Uh, your backgrounds, from what I can tell, uh, range from chemistry, biology, engineering, uh, even non-science. So, uh, so it's, it's a tough uh, job for me to try to, uh, at least the first time I had to address such a broad and diverse audience, I'll do my best. And um, so here uh, is a quick, uh, the outline, including the uh, ability to try to introduce to you microfluidics as a tool of the future to bridge the multiple skills that, that form the complexity of biology and of, of life itself. And then I'll talk about some examples specifically on how we, our lab has been processing blood and trying to get multiple scaling uh, information from blood. And, uh, and more recently, um, it's a hot and popular field in, in cell engineering, immunotherapy, gene therapy. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some effort, briefly about some efforts in my lab. And finally, I'll talk about more of the scale up to the, the larger systems, but trying to represent it from a microphysiological system. So uh, we, these days we hear a lot about precision medicine and what that entails, of course, there's a lot of promises um, made in terms of how we can um, have medicine uh, pre-symptomatically uh, detect disease onset, uh, trying to even just maintain uh, the high quality of life, keeping our uh, system um, afloat in terms of uh, healthy and living a good life. Uh, but it boils down to truly trying to get that target. That, and, and I call it, I, I, I coined it the minimal representative unit, MRU. And there are two ways to look at this. The MRU could be, um, if you look at a person uh, on the left here, you see um, you maybe a drop of blood or, or a tissue sample. You try to get the minimum uh, sample that has the target of interest. You know, it could be the cancer cell. It could be the mutation, the cancer DNA or it could be um, your glucose uh, level in terms of diabetics. Uh, so you're trying to get the minimal sample that can predict your health status, your, your <clears throat> physiological condition, or for many cases, just fundamentally understand physiology. So minimal sample, that's called the top down, you're extracting the MRU, minimal representative unit. On the right hand side, there's the flip of it, which is, if you want to build um, up a minimal model that represents the whole system, um, not just take, just taking the sample will not do it. You want to be able to build something that represents, for instance, organ, like your eye or your, or your kidney or your brain or your liver, your colon. Um, and uh, by building that up, understanding some of the basic uh, structures and constituents that, al that allow you to predict from that small tissue um, or the small sample that you built up from bottom up, um, what the body, how the body would respond accordingly, uh, you would uh, also be able to, to generate a bottom up MRU. 
and and what you see um, in in these circles are different um, areas of MRU efforts, meaning um, current research and paradigms of looking at trying to, to tease out the MRU. Uh, eventually, what precision medicine is trying to do is come up with um, what people have, um, oops, sorry, the, the animation here is supposed to be uh, highlighting the, the top circle, which is the theranostics, uh, which is pr pretty much um, combining or integrating uh, diagnostics and therapy. Uh, so someone can, um, can at the same time detect a disease coming onset uh, at the same time before it even uh, develops into symptoms, uh, treatments happening. And many of these technologies are allowing you to do that. Uh, but my main point here is to say that uh, microfluidics, which is a, a way that you can handle samples at uh, dimensions of so-called 10 to 100 microns um, in, in terms of its critical dimensions, is the scale that you manipulate a single cell. And if you can manipulate, manipulate a single cell, uh, you can start to project, extrapolate up, and you can, um, in terms of uh, met multiple cells and how the cells communicate, and also downwards, where a single cell, what it, is, uh, what it secretes, what it expresses, and that tells you, single cell analysis tells you how each of the cells are reacting. So microfluidics became a processor, much like the integrated circuits have become for our um, computers, uh, eventually linking it all up to become the uh, internet and, and, and internet of things. Uh, here, I, I, I would say that microfluidics has a chance to rival that, maybe even on a larger scale because of complexity of biology and the interest to improve life, and that's the main purpose. So in, I just put this slide briefly just to say that there's a new paradigm shift recently as well with the 2018 Nobel Prize winner uh, was on immunotherapy, cancer immunotherapy. And so this new paradigm um, is, takes from the past where medicine is traditionally trying to treat the symptom. Um, I think immunotherapy is a turning point where we now try to uh, really treat the root of cause because the body is reacting. Sometimes it's not necessarily what's invading the body, but it's how, how the body reacts. And this interplay between um, foreign uh, invasion or, or changes to the body's response is the whole system. So really, it's something relatively new, relatively new in terms of uh, Western medicine, but in Eastern medicine, of course, we have a lot of uh, more holistic approaches and um, and more of the uh, thought of the whole body uh, treatment is all connected. Uh, but immune, this, will, this will really change it because now we use more modern science and, and more modern technologies to look at the interplay. So I, I myself, as well as many groups in the, in the world with microfluidics are looking at both sides, how the body is responding, how, um, how biological anal analysis is happening uh, hand in hand. So, and uh, I mentioned this quickly, but I would just still mention this. The cell is pretty much a mammalian cell, uh, typically between 5 and 20, uh, 20 microns uh, in general. Uh, and the microfluidic chips, uh, in terms, of, it is using similar to integrated circuit technology, but it's much a little larger because of the, um, the steps that involve the third dimension, meaning the thickness of the wafer in the circuit. You only have a very thin film. Here you have a, a third dimension. So, uh, manipulating between 10 to 20 microns is the sweet spot of microfluidics. And if you have electrodes that are those dimensions, you can create gradients. And so, the, again, the physics tells us that we can manipulate cells and its molecules uh, at ease with many of the current improvements, advancements of microfluidics technologies. Um, and so the bridging between the skills that I mentioned throughout this talk, I'm going to mention throughout the talk, uh, bridges from the molecular scale up to the uh, body scale and treatments and diagnostics. And that's because microfluidics is that linkage. It can scale up and scale down. And, and this, uh, this is where uh, digital biology links to single cell analysis, links to quantitative biology in physiology, 
and ways that you can predict much more precisely um, ways to treat and diagnose. So I'm going to dive right into some of the examples and technologies that my lab has been pursuing. And the first one here is really focusing on sample uh, processing and sam subpopulation enrichment. And you'll see what I mean in the next few slides. Um, so I, there are many different samples that you can take from the body, uh, but one of the primary ones is blood. Um, blood is part of the circulatory system, but it's very, very useful and has a lot of information because it circulates. You, when you take a drop of blood, it might have gone through the whole body in terms of its capillaries, all the different organs, the peripherals, uh, your brain, uh, your heart, your lung. It goes through all these places. And if your body has any kind of change in any particular area, that information gets spread out and conveyed and transported throughout the body. So that's why it's so fascinating to look at blood and see what is the minimal volume you can uh, process, much like I mentioned the MRU that you need for diagnosing or trying to detect specific changes uh, and, and hopefully down to the molecular scale, which gives you the precision medicine aspect. This is very much uh, right in the sweet spot again of the volumes that um, microfluidics handles. Uh, and we talk typically in terms of the uh, microliters, 50 to 100 micro, microliters is, is what we're looking for in a drop of blood. It has about a few millions, maybe five to 10 million cells. The body has um, 30 trillion cells or so. And so with a small sample, it's really small, you want to assure yourself that it has the target, it has a minimal, it has the sample, it has the information that you want. And so it turns out that many of the recent developments have told us that um, we can, we are able to detect um, that um, what's happening uh, in the 30 trillion cells that are circulating through the body uh, with these few million cells in a drop of blood, which is very exciting. And but it requires a lot of a lot of uh, new technology development and understanding of <coughs> fundamental biology. Um, So the, that is because blood has is composed of uh, consists of many many different types of cells, and these cells uh, have different functions. They interact with each other. They they might take information from uh, a part of the body <clears throat> to another part that will affect it. Like cancer cells can transport from if it's metastatic, can transfer from one site to another, which we want to understand how that happens, that's an example. And stem cell-like properties and, and how things change uh, are also triggered by the whole system through the blood uh, circulation. Uh, these are different types of cells, different sizes. Uh, again, sweet spot of microfluidics is I can take a drop of blood and, and look at these individual components. And that's something that uh, many researchers, including our lab, has been pursuing. However, there has been a recent, uh, some of you may have uh, learned about uh, a particular company and that's featured in this book called Lab Bad Blood. And I would just tell you that uh, hopefully that does not uh, contaminate or taint your impression of this exciting field. Um, what I want to say is this, this company started very early. My first postdoc actually was hired to work at that company and he left after six months. Um, and they, of course, had a lot of problems, scandals, and uh, ethics issues. Uh, most importantly, they did not follow the scientific uh, method to pursue their technology. But what I want to mention here is more positive spin, is that they, they raised a lot of money. And therefore, there is a huge need and desire to be able to process blood and uh, get really small amounts of blood, small volumes of blood, and get a lot of information that helps your health. So there's a need, there's a desire, and there's money out there because they raised a lot of money. Uh, but at, at the same time, it's a, it really requires technology, new technology development that they were not willing to invest in. And that kind of is one of the keys to their downfall. Um, and I, again, you, you can always uh, think of um, people in scientific, they, they make their best scientific guess. But in my case, I think microfluidics held the key and my postdoc was laid off because they decided not to trust in microfluidics. So the new technology needs to be developed 
uh, to pursue this uh, huge dream, huge vision um, that um, was the original motivation for that, um, that company that failed. So here, I will um, show one particular technology called the, um, called the Lateral Cavity Acoustic Transducer. We call it LCAT in my lab. And uh, these pictures are students in the past that contributed to the research. So just want to acknowledge their hard work, their creativity, and their, um, you know, their really strong um, ability to take uh, concepts and take it to um, really, they're contributing a lot into the life sciences industry as we speak, like Armando. So here I have uh, an example of uh, technology that I call uh, LCAT, and it's based on a fundamental physics um, of acoustic microstreaming. And there was a paper published in 2003 that shows that if you have an, inter you have an interface, an air-liquid interface, this bubble here that you see on the left top corner of that picture, if that's vibrating at a certain frequency, um, the, the fluid right next to that interface will move with that frequency. However, um, because the fluid is by nature viscous, and so this viscous is shear trans, um, is able to, um, this viscous shear uh, is able to be transported to farther away from the interface. And this viscous has a secondary, second order uh, by um, transport uh, called acoustic streaming. So that results in these, this kind of a pattern of streaming where far away from this small little bubble, uh, you have a lot of, we have large motions of fluid, even though the, the liquid itself is only, the air bubble is only moving a fraction of this, um, this dimension of that vortex. So these two vortices result from that little bubble. On the right-hand side, on top here, would be a movie that shows how particles will follow the trajectory. So I'm not going to show that movie. Um, but if we align on the bottom left, you can see if we align these bubbles in a microfluidic channel, and I, and I just tried to explain here, there's three channels from the left entering and merging into a, um, a center channel. Um, the left, the top and the bottom are white areas are air and the more grayish areas are uh, liquid. So if you, apply, if you put this whole chip on top of an acoustic trans, transducer or a, piezo, a PZT um, transducer, you will uh, activate the air bubble, um, air liquid interface because of the density difference. That means the air, the sound travels uh, at higher speeds in um, the liquid and the density um, difference causes them to, to really focus the vibration at the interface. Um, so I'm going to show the movies uh, real quick. You can see if I just the bottom here is a acoustic um, piezo on top is a is a is a microfluidic chip. I can take a fluid from the left that uses those kinds of L cats that pushes fluid. So it's a pumping effect from the left chip to the right chip. Oh, okay. So. You, 
what you just saw was uh, the right bottom um, chip that has a tube that moves fluids from one chip to another. Uh, I'm going to show another movie. Would have seen is these little particles will start to move and so add up to be a pumping effect. And here is maybe a movie that might be more interesting. So we again have these lateral um, planted channels that have dead end bubbles trapped. And when you have that interface vibrating because it's on top of a piezo actuator, uh, you create a microfluidic acoustic streaming like I mentioned earlier. Um, but because of this angle, you only have one vortex on top and on bottom. You can see these vortices, and there's some red and green cells representing cells, colored um, dots that are representing cells. They're trapped in those little vortices. Uh, the smaller pink dots are particles that are small, uh, and so they represent the fluid stream. If I look at um, more detail of the movie, you can see more details that there is that vortex that you can, oh, I can't speak. So in that movie that you just saw, uh, you can see that the air-liquid interface, at that interface, these cells are, are trapped in um, the vortex. And there are small, there are different types of orbits that they are um, taking. Um, and that, that will, later on, I will explain that that will dictate um, in terms of the size that they, um, they actually orbit uh, around uh, is, on a, is kind of separating in their size. The smaller ones are become part of the pumping effect where it just continues to go from left to right. So the significance of this technology is such that um, you have a pump, you have a built-in pump that I showed in the previous slide. Uh, you also have a trap, a filter. So larger size um, cells or particles can be trapped in these vortices along the microfluidic channel. And as the fluid moves from left to right, it filters out larger particles or it filters away smaller particles and traps larger particles. And I can actually set the amplitude such that different sizes of particles get trapped and released. And therefore, you can sequent serially, uh, sequentially collect the samples and downstream. I can collect them in different size batches. So that's, that's what the technology holds. So you can trap cells. Okay, so this, this shows that if you put, instead of a fluid, a general fluid, like I showed in the cartoon earlier, I put in blood. And I, as I showed earlier, blood has all these different cells, different sizes. It has plasma that has proteins and lipids and other types of uh, molecules that are inside uh, the plasma itself. So when we go, so I put blood, this is whole blood actually in our device. And we put it on top of acoustic uh, transducer, and I start to actuate it. Um, you can see from the top left, the red blood, and then the bottom left, um, just the device itself. I will show a couple of videos, but let me talk through it first. Bottom one that's um, with the letter M6, and the right one, M5, what we're going to show is whole blood moving through the um, channels that are in a serpentine, a serpentine fashion, uh, and there will be red blood cells moving slower, or the blood cells will move slower than the plasma, and they will separate out as you collect them downstream.
Okay, so as you can see, uh, the blood, the red part, which has a lot of the, uh, the red blood cells, that's why it's red, our blood is red because of the red blood cells. You can see that there is a front of the fluid that's moving that's a different color, more transparent color, and that is the, uh, the so-called uh, plasma that's being moved faster because it's not trapping. The cells are actually, the fluid is moving faster and the red blood cells are being trapped. So after a while, you'll see that if you put particles in there, they'll be trapped. Or if you were able to look at the next slide, I'll show here that this is whole blood, no particles are in there. Over time, you can have several steps, but over time, this, on the left, you see whole blood. The middle, you see the intermediate stage where um, some of the red blood cells continue to be pumped. Um, but what you left behind are larger cells. And in this case, they're actually white blood cells. Actually, I will show this movie because it's important for many of the things I'm going to talk about in the next other slides. So what you've seen there is um, the white blood cells after a while, when the red blood cells are all filtered out, you have the white blood cells remaining. And that, that is a feature of this uh, technology that I mentioned, very simple concept. You have a pump and you have a trap that has a cutoff size. And so you can trap cells that are above a certain size. And this becomes very handy for many of the applications that I will be mentioning. So when you look at blood, as an example, you can take, um, in this case, uh, trying to spike in different diameter particles, in this case, 15 microns and 25 micron particles. Uh, at the end of the uh, outlet, you can see that you have an enrichment of those particles because originally, you have on the top there, you see the original 25 micron meter fluorescence image, you only see one um, 25 micrometer fluorescence bead, a particle. But after collection, because you trap them in those vortices and then you let them go and you collect them, you see how much you enrich them. So you can enrich them by 500, 600 times, as you see on the graph on the left. And 15 to 25 microns is somewhat significant because that most of the um, circulating tumor cells are larger in size and between 15 microns and 25 microns. So if you're able to enrich for those particles, so initially being very, very dilute, like you see on the top right black box, uh, it becomes much more easier to collect many more in the sample if you can enrich them into, a, into the same volume of fluid. And just to demonstrate how it looks like, uh, you would see something to the effect of this movie. So what you've seen in that movie there is, uh, are the very, very few cells that we trapped. And it can be down to the so-called rare cell population. Rare cell typically is, is defined as less than 1,000 cells per milliliter. So when you have very few cells, you want to be able to trap them. You want to be able to enrich them so you can do an analysis and diagnosis based on it. Another, another very uh, useful way of using this is if you have a sample and you have a specific population, which we sometimes call side populations, 
Uh, and they may have certain properties like stem cell-like properties. They may develop into cancer or may have, have the markers for meta, uh, metastasis. Um, it is critical that you can capture these cells, but not only capture these cells, uh, but not disturb them because cells are live entities. They are easily changing in how they respond, their states and so on. So if you uh, use me methods such as labeling and other types of processing techniques, you may disturb its original state and have an inaccurate uh, diagnosis. And in this particular example here that we've uh, carried out, we try to look at a specific DU145 cell line and their ranges of sizes, cell sizes are seven micron to 28 microns. Um, and this is a, a met, uh, basically a prostate metastatic um, cell that has, has metastasized to the brain. And we can pick that up as a marker, as an example marker for, um, for cancer, uh, circulating tumor cells. Or you can look at just pure from your healthy blood. I can just try to pick up the larger monocytes. And that has implications, again, for stem-like properties or just the immune system how it's responsive or not in terms of the macrophage development. So breast cancer uh, cells, and we did uh, different types of cells, and we've shown that we can get large um, enrichment ratios, which is simply the target cells over the, um, over the original population of cells, like in this case, white blood cells. So you're trying to enrich uh, from the background which is the healthy cells. We've been able to get average size 18 mark. We've been able to take from uh, patient blood. Um, and okay, in this case, it's a spike one, but later we did some patient blood and we were able to pick up 99% at least based on several experiments, um, all of the, rare, the cell population that we spiked in. And we're talking about 10, um, 10 cells per milliliter, in, as you show in this plot here, and still getting a very high enrichment ratio sufficient for single cell analysis. So the next I'll talk quickly about is, okay, the blood has all these components, constituents. It has its cells, it has the plasma. What do you do with the rest of it? And, and my vision here is to take blood, small sample of blood, but look at the whole spectrum, the whole panel, uh, what's expressed in the plasma, what kinds of antibodies you have, uh, what's in the white blood cells, how are these different white blood cells activated or not, uh, and red blood cells, and so on. So here are some examples of that other skill dimension. So you have the, uh, if I sequentially isolate the blood cells, I can look at, I can take the blood. If you look at the sample of blood, you see um, the whole blood on the top, and there are there are different cells in there. Like I, the basic ones, as we all know, are the plasma, the white blood cells, and the red blood cells. So if I were able to, if I can separate out all the cells, trap them in our LCAT in those vertices that I showed earlier, um, I can look at just the platelet account accounts. And if you have too many. We can be an indicator of stroke or heart attack, and too few, again, might be your blood is not clotting well. You might have indications of pointing towards possibility of leukemia or lymphoma. If you look at the red blood cells, if I can separate out just the red blood cells and, and look at them, um, and if you look at their morphology, you can start to see if you might have indications of sickle cell or anemia, um, sickle cell anemia or leukemia. And the white blood cells tell you a lot about your immune system, autoimmune disorders, HIV. Um, and if you have too many because you're fighting cancer, you, you might have, again, tumor uh, or TB. So these are uh, five different uh, main uh, types of white blood cell leukocytes that we've been able to take out and stain um, and identify and also prove their viability. We can also just look at the analytes, like you typically go to a doctor and take uh, draw blood. We draw a, a little bit too much blood, in my opinion. The last time I went, they had 50 milliliters of my blood taken. Um, but the idea is that I wanted to compare with the current standard practice. If our LCAT takes blood 
and separates out different components, do they match what the current standard laboratory, clinical laboratory diagnostics tells us? So we try to do that with centrifuge plasma, which is typical of a, um, a clinical laboratory. And in this case, look for different components. I'm just going to show a couple. One is glucose. Um, you look at patients with different types of anticoagulants and you'll see that they're very, very similar in the glucose levels that we detect, except for patient one. And there's always uh, something anomaly or some, some, some probably mistake that we've taken. But the red is LCAT, and the, the, the beige or the greenish um, is uh, the centrifuge separated blood plasma. And if I look at the, um, and again, a very important one, especially for current uh, fighting of the um, COVID-19, um, is your data antibody expression. So it really, IgG is an example. We can use our LCAT to separate out the plasma, and we look at the um, IgG expression concentration and very, very much the same as what you'd get with a drop of blood instead of um, cubes of blood, getting the same kind of readout. So this is very assuring that our technology does not do anything um, inadvertently change the, the figures or change the uh, um, quantity of the analytes of interest. And specifically for viral detection, uh, I'm showing a quick example of using the basic functions of LCAT, the pumping and the mixing, because you create vortices that also creates a rapid mixing, which is very difficult in microfluidic um, devices. So we show here, um, the uh, device that are able to look at continuous monitoring of co-infections by HSV, HPV, and HIV in patients. So in HSV and HPV in HIV positive patients. So which means that if you have HIV, uh, it's very, it's women, especially women, very likely to develop HPV, which is, which is also very, very dangerous because it's, uh, it can cause cancer, uh, herpes or um, papilloma virus. Um, so we use this device here in collaboration with Antigen Discovery, Inc. to uh, rapidly detect uh, multiple analytes that um, indicate co-infection, which is very difficult to do with other technologies. So we have a, um, a panel of 156 antigens from HIV, HSV, HPV, and control, which is the pinkish one, and we looked at, try, we looked at trying to take um, the plasma and put it in this device and pump it through and rapidly uh, mix it so that you can get these signals. And this next slide shows the reactivity of HIV positive um, comparing serum and saliva. It's very, very similar. And so for HIV positive patients, we have very accurate readout from the saliva. It was not as accurate and we're still working on it in HSP and HPV. But nonetheless, we use, if we use just the serum, it's very accurate, uh, we can then um, look at HIV, HPV, dual patients. And so, um, so this is very important because once you have HIV, what happens is typically your immune system is obviously compromised. And so your readout of other types of antibodies will not be as accurate. But having multiple antigens uh, allows you to tease out that information and, quick, and be more precise in detecting these diseases that kind of interplay. And I mentioned how complex it is or your immune system is fighting one disease, and, you, and if you develop another disease, uh, you can't use, the immune system is compromised, you cannot accurately diagnose, uh, in some cases, the other diseases that are co-infections. So just comparing serum and saliva for, for HIV, as you can see, the pads and the different, um, the, the, the um, levels of, um, of the intensity is very, very similar. Um, so this is a platform that we are, we've been able to, to do something that typically takes three to four hours in the, in the lab setting, down to about less than 20 minutes. Uh, we are also able to really compare HIV-positive serum and saliva samples and also see that they have significant reactivity with both HSV and HPV, which tells why they can be difficult to, uh, to diagnose at the same time. Um, so you need a multiplex assay that we just developed here, um, and we're developing these serodiagnostic markers so you can take it to the field and do rapid diagnosis. We are also working on converting this platform for the current to fight the current SARS-CoV-2. I will uh, talk a little bit about a couple of other examples, switching gears 
because once you take a lot of like trillion millions of cells at least uh, down to a handful or in some cases thousands of cells uh, you can now have a much more manageable popular subpopulation is like what we call it to to more accurately read out what um, the condition is and what we use is this a new this area that's taken off in the last 10 years which is a single cell analysis so if you take blood for example you might try to separate out the the cell of interest but then the size overlap a lot uh, the white blood cells healthy ones and leukemia cells are very similar in size so in order not to have false negatives you want to collect all of the uh, cells that are white blood cells and above and that's what the right hand side of graph is showing just overlap in the size and and we can also sort them based on their markers so these are ways that currently are being used uh, what we want to show you is that trying first of all trying trying to first enrich for the cell target interest subpopulation and then um, being able to do single cell analysis that distinguishes between healthy white blood cells and cancerous leukemia cells that look very similar from the eye in some cases but um, let me just show you a video So what you just see, you just saw there in that video is it's not for leukemia in that case, but it's just demonstration of a single cell array trap. And this has been developed by others, uh, including Hang Lu at Georgia Tech. Uh, but we adopted it for this particular application where we can trap, take blood that's already, um, already enriched to some degree and filter out the rest of red blood cells through these microfluidically, microfabricated traps and capture larger cells, anything above a white blood cell we capture into these single cell trapping arrays. And and then you can see we can capture uh, white blood cells that overlap in diameters as shown in the bottom right graph. Uh, on the left graph, you can see when the fluid flows back and forth in these channels, the larger cells get trapped, eventually forming an array of single cells. And if you were to expand this, because microfabrication technology can be easily scaled up, you get this kind of a, a larger scale single cell analysis. So I can take a volume of blood and enrich for a subpopulation and then trap every cell that might be suspicious. Uh, we can go all the way up to about 100,000 cell, single cell traps. And I collaborate with uh, Dr. Michelle Digman and her uh, former uh, PhD student Ning Ma, and we work we work to try to do label-free um, metabolic identification of these cells that are trapped. And so what we uh, launched, they have a technology called fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy. Uh, because of time, I won't go into much detail. You can look up their papers. Uh, the idea is that there are there is an intrinsic metabolite NADH. And if it's bound, bound um, or an unbound, you will have a different lifetime that can be indicated by this, the lifetime of the fluorescence um, that it emits. And that lifetime itself is represented by this so-called phaser plot. The easier way to look at it is it shifts from red to green at the bottom right graph here uh, in terms of going from a more oxfos, uh, more healthy cell-like um, metabolism to a more uh, glycolytic uh, metabolism uh, in terms of the greenish. So we look at that signature to indicate whether a cell is healthy or cancerous. And with that, we are actually able to take that blood, separate out the, the white blood cells, and identify uh, these plots that show uh, the, the signatures of different types of white blood cells and leukemia cells. Um, these are uh, typical ones that are K562 um, or JERCAT or PHP1, they have different features. So not only can you separate between healthy white blood cells and leukemia cells, but you can also separate from the different types 
low leukemia cells. And each of these dots indicate a single cell um, signature from its slim analysis. And it's pretty much the metabolic state. So I can separate, I can take the cancer patient, I can try to monitor its cancer cells. If you have treatment, you can monitor the treatment as well. And so now we combine the two, the microfluidic trap and the um, microfluidic trap here uh, that can capture and filter in size-based uh, and combine it with this phaser uh, metabolic slim uh, detector. It has a very powerful screening tool. So if you have a single cell trap, now you have e easy access to the single cells that are already extracted from a large population. Um, I, you might say label free is still prone to some mistake because there's some, uh, it's, it's more complicated. You want to be very, very, very sure uh, what the, gene um, the genotype is or the expression level is. So we also work with Dr. Kumar with Ram Uh He has an AFM tip that he can go and we develop a microfluidic chip compatible with it. Uh, so you can go and probe and, and go inside the cell uh, that's trapped in a microfluidic chip and apply the so-called dielectrophoresis and extract out the mRNA. And that gives you a signature based on qPCR. And so I can actually now detect um, if you have either the housekeeping genes, which is a good control, or uh, certain like CD45, more indicative of uh, white blood cells and HER2 in terms of breast uh, cancer, uh, EPCAN, more metastatic state uh, detection. So with this, you have a powerful tool from the single cell level to go from metabolic physiological state down to uh, more of the genetic um, expression state. Um, this I won't go too, too much, but show you a cartoon may be good. You can sh see if I can combine this, I can expand this single cell trap to look at cell to cell interaction. I can flow in one direction and trap one type of cell, and flow in the other direction, trap another type of cell, that's the red cell, and put them together to look at their uh, communication between the two cells. And that could be important because uh, immune, immune synapses and other types of synapses rely on cell to cell contact or at least vicinity. So you have this uh, synaptic uh, paracrine signaling. Um, so you can, you can use this kind of device to study whether cell to cell can be activated and you can also trap them, so you can, you can start to culture them in situ. It shows um, some results. This is actually a, a probably pretty early data that I'm showing you here, green and red there, showing on the top right side. So one of the areas that in my lab is becoming uh, more and more prevalent is this notion of uh, cell engineering. And I'm just gonna show a few slides with some of the attempts. Because I'm so fascinated by this immunotherapy and how T cells are activated, how antigen presenting cells um, are able to gobble up the, uh, the, the, the foreign cells and only express the, um, the antigen peptide uh, on, its, um, on its MHC or its antigen presenting molecule. Uh, and this interaction between T cell, tumor cell, and, and, and dendritic cell is just, there are just so many interesting things. They also can have cytokines uh, trigger out and eventually you have the T cell and the B cells. Um, and there's also the recent adoptive cell therapy, which, or, or you have this CAR T, which allows you to take a patient a sample and try to harvest and expand for T cells uh, specific for the tumor. And, and has very, very tremendous results that saved a lot of lives. What can microfluidics do here? Um, so one thing we try to do is try to mimic that antigen presenting cell, uh, creating artificial cells. And we're working on trying to do it for um, cancer therapy. But here we show a simple uh, demonstration of that, and that is trying to create um, a beta cell synapse or uh, for insulin secretion. So some of the uh, diabetic patients uh, require stimulation of the, um, their beta cells for more insulin secretion. So we're able to show that this fluid membrane that's made out of microfluidic technology uh, can, artificial cell can trigger a real biological cell. Another way of demonstrating cell engineering is this 
lipoplex uh, technology, which is a way to use uh, cationic lipids uh, with complexes with the um, DNA that you want to deliver for gene therapy, for example, um, creating these lipoplex nanoparticles. We were able to create a platform, microfluidic platform, that mixes together cells and uh, the reagent lipopectin uh, very rapidly into these microfluidic droplets. The droplets then um, will encapsulate the single cell and the reagents and rapidly mix so you have uniform sizes of the particles and uniform delivery into the cells. And as a result, this technology is kind of uh, pretty sophisticated. There, uh, you can see that we were able to get a, lot, a big shift in terms of um, from bulk, uh, the bulk method, bulk lipofection versus drop it lipofection. Bulk is the, the pink in the graph, and the yellow is the droplet lipofection. So you can see a huge difference in its fluorescence intensity and mm -hmm. very uniform as well. And uh, we showed that we can, can, uh, we can transfect uh, plasmid, uh, for instance, GFP, very uniformly into so-called suspended cells, like those leukemia cells that we showed earlier, and very uniformly and at high efficiency. So bulk ones get 5% of a transfection. Typically, we, with uh, our early tests, we were able to get 10 times better in delivery. So is it, this is very promising where microfluidics can play a huge role in uh, delivery and transfection of cells. And we use this, and I won't go into detail, but you might have heard of a gene, uh, a gene editing tool that's taking off called CRISPR-Cas9. We use the same method to show that we can also edit a part of the gene in the cells, single cells, with this technology. Um, last, last kind of example I was showing using, using LCAT again. You remember the cells swirling at those vortices. I can use that technology as well to deliver uh, cargo into the cell. And, or you can label cells. So the beauty, again, is I can trap cells. I put in different types of washing reagents that are pumped through there, and they're uniformly mixed and swirling. At the same time, I can deliver reagents that go in or on outside of the cell. So it can be a really um, efficient way to manage in cell engineering. And it just shows that in situ for staining of cells, we can do the same thing. Staining of cells with LCAT versus standard, you can see very much the same kinds of uh, intensities that you get from both. So we're, we're, this is an area that's still ongoing. We're, we're hopeful to, to show more results in the coming year. Okay, and um, this, this ASM tip, we are also working with Dr. Kumar, Rick Ramasinghe to, uh, to deliver things in. With two minutes or so, I'm gonna just quickly mention the last um, part of my presentation, which is this vascularized microorgans. And I collaborate, uh, started by Steve George and Chris Hughes, my two colleagues, um, Steve George at UC Davis, Chris Hughes at UC Irvine. Um, one's vascular biologist, one's a tissue engineer. Uh, we, came, we started out 10 years ago to try to recapitulate the connective tissue that has um, blood vessels. So if we have an artery, the red um, artery that's connected at the tissue level to the blue uh, veins or the venules, um, there's capillary um, vessels in between. And so can we, if you have uh, drug discovery and normally with a 2D, like on the bottom you see normal uh, models are 2D cell cultures. Um, the other extreme is the total human. And in between, there are animal models or spheroids. But one thing that's lacking, either it, it's the complexity of this physiology um, or um, the blood vessels. The mouse may have blood vessels, but they have very different metabolic and other types of systems that, that cause us not to be as precise in prediction. So we developed something that might use your own human cells developing a platform for you to test for drugs. So here you see um, the result, and I would, if we had, I would be able to show, let me show.
so you see that we were able to show that we grown tissue with uh, blood vessels in there and the those little green particles are moving inside the vessel. So what happens on the bottom one that you saw a confocal image that's turning around is blood vessels infiltrating a tumor, little tumor. And so if you deliver drugs through the vasculature, it recapitulates how drugs are delivered if you are undergoing chemotherapy and predicts better with vessels how the blood the tumors would grow versus without um, the blood vessels. So we are excited about this technology. We even started a company that that's called Ericari Biosciences, and, and um, the three of us are co-founders as well, and we're trying to develop a platform that can use it for drug screening. So to kind of summarize my talk, I showed you a lot of technology, maybe too many things, um, but how you can process for the MRU, which is the minimal representative unit, for precision medicine, closing the loop. And what we're closing is not only the loop from the skill, from the molecular skill to the, um, from the molecular skill to the body skill, from the health skill, um, but also from diagnostics to treatment. Um, I think microfluids holds the key, the critical key that connects the skills and connects these, um, being, able to, being able to see it holistically because you capture and you have precise tools to analyze. And it's much like looking at a drawing. You either look for a Waldo, which is um, which might be in this picture. That's the top down, looking at the minimal representative unit from top down. Or you take a painting and just crop out a little part uh, and try to predict, can I look at how these dots are put together to predict what this painting is, who the painter is. And that's another practice. That's more like the organ on a chip uh, project that I showed at the end. And like Da Vinci shows, studied the science of art, studied the art of science. Uh, we are trying to develop ways to see art, science and art, and that's like fundamental science and technology go hand in hand. And I think it's a really good representation of how uh, biomedical engineering is playing out. I'm also a uh, lab on a chip editor in chief. If those of you that are academicians out there, these are some thematic collections and the thought leaders, uh, if you're interested. Uh, you may contact us in terms of trying to uh, submit your papers to this journal. And also run the, uh, the um, CADNAM Research Center, and a lot of companies are involved. If you're a company interested in, um, in joining our center, please contact me as well. And finally, I want to just give uh, recognition to my very hardworking and talented students um, and the funding sources and all my collaborators. Thank you very much, and I look forward to receiving your questions and having more discussions.